This is the Volleyball Coaching Wizards podcast, covering everything coaching. Motivated and inspired by interviews and conversations with some of the world's great volleyball coaches. To learn more about the project, visit VolleyballCoachingWizards.com. Now here are your hosts, John Foreman and Mark Levijou. All right, we're doing something a little different with this particular episode. Um, Mark happened to get a question from a listener, which we strongly encourage, so feel free. Uh, so we'll we'll have Mark read that off, and then we'll uh, go from there. Okay, so firstly, I just want to reiterate what uh, John just said. We encourage listeners, so we're, we're happy to have them and happy to have proof that we have one. <laughs> um, so thanks, Ronnie, for the question. And... Uh, Ronnie's not uh, a native English speaker, but uh, so that might be a little bit uh, inelegantly uh, stated, but I think we, we can all understand it. So the question is, how do you get along with not being successful? Who do you blame for losses? Do you take it personally? Everyone ba- blames a coach for players, for bad playing players and lost matches. As a coach... You have to have a strategy not to trap yourself in the role of a scapegoat. I thought that last bit was really interesting. Yeah. Having a strategy to not trap yourself into being the scapegoat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it actually kind of made me think about something your brother wrote about, Alexis. Yeah. Um, and he was doing it very tongue-in-cheek at the time, but he, it was basically the idea of lowering initial expectations <laughs> so that they're they're quite easily met and thus keep you from becoming said scapegoat. Well, that is that is coaching 101, is uh, managing expectations. And um, the first thing that you do is, uh, is reduce them as far as you can conceivably do it. And uh, when you exceed expectations, everyone's, everyone's happy. But there, in the, the latest book by... L. John Vertheim, the uh, uh, journalist and sports writer from Sports Illustrated, he's talking about uh, the actual benefits of being the underdog and that uh, there are psychological benefits in being an underdog and painting yourself as the underdog. So um, it's not only a valuable technique for keeping your job, it's actually a valuable technique for uh, being successful. Well, that's true, and I think we all have seen plenty of examples of even maybe potential favorites trying to paint themselves as underdogs. Um, unfortunately, we can't always be in that sort of situation. Um, yeah. Obviously, if you do a pretty good job coaching, you are likely to come at least once, a, once in a while upon a time when you're the favorite. Uh, so how do you manage expectations in that sort of case? It is a, it is a really interesting question. All, uh, all jokes aside. And the, I think that coaches can go about things a couple of different ways. And, um, the way that, that I tend to go about things, and maybe this is the, the, the thing that Ronnie wants uh, to stop doing is, at some level, the, the coach is, is organizing everything and he has some uh, responsibility for, uh, for the result. And, and if a player is not able to play, then at some level, it, it is true that the coach has not been able to find the, the correct solution uh, to that. And I think that strategy is the only way to improve as a coach and to improve your team. Um, to keep to to keep thinking, to keep it in the the realm of what uh, what you, what I can do to make things better. So there was a, you posted something with a, with several Popovich quotes. Yes, uh, and one of them I thought related to this, and it and it had to do with if you lose, you go back to work. You know, and and you know, try to find a way to win. And if you if you win, I think or something along, you know, you just carry on. I, I don't I don't have it right in front of me. Um, but I mean, it's it was basically you know that this is all you can do is if you lose, okay, get back to work. 
that's that's pretty much it yeah the the central kind of theme of popovich's discussion i think is that uh um that basketball is is not the center of the universe and and uh, to keep things in perspective um in in that sense so that uh you know, it's it's not actually the end of the world. Nothing, nothing, and uh, nothing really happened. And I think he, uh, in one point in the in the clinic, he actually says, in so many words, uh, you don't need to beat your chest because you haven't developed a cure for cancer. You just made a three point shot. <laughs> and uh, maybe, maybe ultimately, that's the answer to the question: is uh, is to keep things to keep things in the correct perspective. And um, as much as we as coaches are motivated, uh, inspired, pu uh, pulled, um, all of these things to, to do the best for our team, to be better, um, to control everything, if, uh, if that's what we're in it for, um, at the end of the day, whether we win or lose, if we're successful or not successful, uh, it is just a game and um, nothing happened in the world. Right. Uh, now, there were a couple of different paths I thought this, this question could take or the discussion of the question anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. And the first was had to do with the idea of blame, which is right at the beginning of the question. Yeah. Um, and when I think of blame, I start thinking about yelling coaches, <laughs> and, you know, and we see it certainly often enough uh, in NFL press conferences afterwards. Yeah. Um, but in our game, we're usually not quite as, as public as that, especially for mm -hmm. the vast majority of the coaches. Um, but yelling can certainly take place after a match. Um, and, and we've talked about it before in terms of, why are you yelling? And, and you know, both of us have blogged about this. I, I know. And are, are you yelling at the team after a match because they really need to be yelled at? Or are you yelling at the team because you need some sort of emotional vent? Um, so that's, you know, when, when I saw blame, that was the kind of the first thing I started going, ah, all right, mm -hmm. this is probably not the right direction to be taking. Yeah. Well, yeah, the the first thing is that um, the coach is the convenient um, convenient figure because uh, it's easier to blame a single coach than all twelve players, unless of course it's one player, and sometimes the one player can get blamed as well. Um, so, in that sense, and I, and I I touched on this before that. It, it's ultimately inevitable that the the coach um, has to wear the the largest portion of the of the responsibility. So um, the first thing a coach has to do is understand that that's what is going to happen regardless. And conversely, um, we'll get an un on also an unfair amount of the praise um, after victories. That that's also the the um, um, the second the second side of the of the question um, the the strategy for for the coach though um, uh, is I think a coach has to find a way uh, to be objective about it and whether that's uh, through discussions with a, a mentor or a colleague uh, or whether it's uh, uh, video, whether it's stats, whether it's a combination of all three, the the coach needs to have a strategy in place that um, can provide some objectivity uh, in what just happened. Because the all of the conversations that you will have with people afterwards are not objective. They are based on um, on uh, emotions, on feelings, um, and as such that even when when people are well-meaning uh they they can't be objective in that sense so the first thing is that, as i said is the coach has to 
uh, has to be aware that it's going to happen and be prepared to take it. But to avoid uh, being scapegoating yourself, at least, you need to have the, um, the means to find an objective uh, answer. Right. And, and this actually touches on some of the stuff that we talked about um, in the, the Turco episode in terms of, you know, what do you do with your team after a match? Um, mm -hmm. when, when positively or negatively, there's a lot of emotion and you don't necessarily have a, a good sense of what actually happened. And, and yep. spectators and media and management and all of them are, are going to suffer from the same um, lack as you are. So <clears throat> to the extent that you can redirect um, and maybe keep it from being that level of discussion, which you can't always do because, like you say, emotions are running high sometimes. And, mm -hmm. you know, as, as much as you may have an objective case to make, people may not be ready to listen to it quite at that point. Um, yeah. And, you know, might have to come down to a, a discussion later. Um, the other area that comes up when I, when I think about this stuff is, is, and you kind of sort of touched on a little bit, is player quality. Now, in any given team, some teams are going to have the best players, some teams are going to have the worst players, and a lot of teams are going to fall somewhere in the middle. And in a lot of leagues, especially when there's money involved, and, and you've, you've been part of this yourself, there are certain teams that are going to be very good. Uh, there are certain teams that are going to be pretty good, but just not going to have the resources to compete with the top teams. And then there's going to be some teams down to the bottom who are maybe you know, just struggling to stay in the league in the first place. Um, the, the issue you run into in a situation like that is realistic expectations. Uh, and, objectivity. Well, yeah, exactly. And objectivity. Um, and the, the kind of the question for me is there's, there's two sides of, of any kind of communication that you're doing, uh, internal and external. Uh, you want obviously to be able to maintain a high level of confidence with your players so that when they go into a match or they're in training or, or whatever, they aren't completely down in the dumps because, you know, they're the, the, the sixth best team in the league. Uh, mm -hmm. going into face number one or number two, um, or just looking at the prospects of, you know, winning the title and the chances are, are virtually zero. Um, there needs to be some level of motivation in the players to, to see some sort of end goal, uh, even if objectively it's not as high as, you know, might, you want, people might like. Um, yeah. So how do you contrast or how do you, how do you, how do you be objective in trying to get, you know, uh, expectations to an appropriate level, while at the same time keeping that confidence up. Everything at some point becomes really complicated, um, <laughs> and and has no answer. Um, the it's a very it's a very interesting and fine line. So you have to be um, uh, to understand the um, the position of your team. So you have to have realistic expectations. But having realistic expectations uh, doesn't mean that you can't uh, strive to be better. And realistic expectations that the other team is better is not the same as realistic as an expectation that you can't win, and um, and those are the differences. So we we play against uh, we play against Kazan, and Kazan's a better team than us. They every single player in the Kazan team has more a bigger salary than our best paid player, and uh, the coach has an Olympic gold medal. And there's no way that you can say that we are better than the, than Kazan, but. It's a game between um, two groups of 15 to 20 people and um, you don't, you can't predict what will happen before the game and everybody has a chance to win it. Now, the chance to win against Kazan is not 90% um, or 60 or 40 or, or 30, maybe it's 15%, uh, but um, 
you you have to continue to to strive for it. So um, convincing the players that they have the possibility if they keep working to have a chance to win um, while um, understanding that uh, they um, that Kazan is, is still better and that's uh, that's what you have to do I, I don't know that I can tell you how to do that all right well let's, let's I don't know that anybody can tell you how to do that yeah. well let's take on the the subject of um, of coaches talking to the media now this isn't gonna actually necessarily directly speak to a lot of coaches that might be listening to this in terms of they're maybe not getting interviewed by a reporter after a match or having press conferences, but it, it mm -hmm. does speak to um, external communication with, with anybody. It could be with, you know, the, the, the people who run the club. It could be with parents. It could be just with spectators or whatever, but you see coaches um, who maybe in, in private behind closed doors are getting in the face of a player for whatever, but yeah you know, at the podium are either taking the blame themselves or are deflecting, um, you know, the responsibility or, you know, basically trying to, to keep it from being a player centric issue um, or at the other, you know, and, and on the other side, sometimes you get the coaches who, who feel the, the need or at the, at the moment, or maybe it's just a slip on their part, but they will call out a single player or they will call out the team in some way to, you know, to, to get a point across. I think, I think there are some coaches who do are, are good at that selectively um, and maybe others not so good. <laughs> maybe you get caught up in the emotion of things. The, there's, there's all the possibilities and um, uh, you can normally tell the, tell the difference, I guess, that um, uh, the, the coach who's deflecting the the blame or the responsibility onto onto others, uh, you can see that in every in every interview. So um, the referees, the, yeah. the the travel, the um, you know the league is against us, uh, um, all, all the things that uh, all the ridiculous things that you, you hear coaches say. Otherwise, um, um, on other occasions, rather it can be. A communication between the coach and the player. It's a, um, um, I guess, an indirect, an, an indirect conversation that uh, um, you know. I want to, I want to point out to you, the player, that uh, you, you, your level was not what, what, uh, what was expected of you. Uh, it can be both of those, but um, my personal, my personal strategy is that I almost never um, single out players so absolutely never single out players negatively and on very rare occasions I might single out individual players um, for uh, some particular uh, good performance so often if I do it it's most often a bench player or or an unsung player um, that I want to point out and and to give a little bit of uh, encouragement in public. Um, otherwise, the the responsibility, if there's any responsibility to take in public, I'll take it on myself. And then I go back and, and be objective with my video, with my mentors, with my statistics to find out what the actual uh, likely, because nobody knows for sure, uh, likely reasons are for whatever it is that happened. All right, now you you brought up the the subject of taking the blame on your own shoulders, um, which like. cir which circles us bl uh, back to kind of where we started this, yes. in terms of the scapegoating. Mm -hmm. because, so we end up walking that line between we're trying to do what what we think is best for the players by not, you know, shining the spotlight on whatever frailties they might have at that particular time, but at the same time we're we're putting ourselves in a position to take the blame and, and to be scapegoated and do, and all these other things. But then again, as you say, and then sometimes we decide to shuffle that off to the referees or the league or, you know, the travel or the weather or whatever 
we can kind of grab hold of. Um, so I, I would, I would, I, I mean, I can kind of imagine your answer to this, but if you're, if you're, if you're making a coaching decision, uh, you know, uh, a, an honest decision, well, that's not actually not, that's not the right word is the honest decision would be, it's probably be in my best interest to shuffle the blame off to somebody outside my, my organization. Yes. <laughs> but from an integrity perspective, if, if you're, you know, if you're sincerely in it for the, for your players, then you're going to take that hit. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Which then begs the question, <laughs> are all these coaches egomaniacs who decide that, you know, they're going to, they're either going to blame somebody else or they're going to let the players take the hit. Uh, I think that we're, we're talking about professional coaches, then, uh, um, I am sure that some of them are egomaniacs. And, uh, so I don't think, uh, don't think we really have to talk too much about that. Um, uh, coaches are always doing something for a reason. And, and, uh, the, the reason is either is one or the other of, um, uh, helping their job, uh, preventing their, uh, keeping their job or improving performance. Um, it's more often the first one than coaches themselves even, uh, would like to admit, but it's one of those, uh, those two things. And, uh, well, I mean, that, that brings up something that I, that I recently did a blog post on, which is the idea of, Wanting to slash needing to prove yourself as a coach. Yeah. How do we go about doing that? You know, what, what is the thing or things that are required of us to have whatever stature, recognition, whatever is required in the position that we're in? And, and, and I think, unfortunately, or, you know, that may not be the right word, but one of the issues that we run into is we can oftentimes have multiple constituencies that, that we're trying to prove ourselves to. Yeah. You know, whether it be our bosses, uh, the press, the, the fans, the team, of course, we're always basically on one level or another trying to prove ourselves to the team. Mm -hmm. um, and we've talked about that before. Uh, sometimes we're trying to prove ourselves to a future employer. You know, a lot yeah. of times we're trying to do that. <laughs> And it's not just, you know, what's on your CV or your resume. Uh, yes. Uh, it's, it's all of those things. It's, um, I don't know what to say. It's like life. You know, the, the actual, the biggest way to avoid being scapegoated is just to throw everybody else under the bus, really, if you want to put it down to that. Well, and, and I was going to say the, the best way to not be scapegoated is to win all the time, but as we've seen, even that's not enough because the expectations get so high that it's not how, it's not that you win, it's how you win. You're always going to get shit. And it doesn't matter. If you win, it's, it'll be about how you won or how you did something. If you don't win, it's about, um, um, about winning. It's, there's always something. Yep. Somebody's parent, somebody didn't play enough, somebody played too much, you took your timeouts, you didn't take your timeouts. There's always something. If somebody, uh, let me put it that way, let me put it a different way. If somebody wants to find something, they will always find, be able to find something. Right. That's all. Actually, one of those quotes that you, you put up from Popovich was kind of funny in that perspective because he was talking about timeouts. Yes, that's why I included it. Right. And it was, it wasn't just that you took them. You know, it was what they looked like. <laughs> Sometimes you have to play the game. Yes. Yes. So to conclude, I, I think, or to, to bring everything together, it's, uh, it's very difficult because the, in the end, if somebody wants to be critical, they can always find something to be critical about. Uh, it can be performance, it can be uh, style, it can be communication is the big, is the, the, 
one that people talk about all the time now and um, that, that can be used to, to describe lots of different things. So people will always find something if they want to find something. Uh, and the coach has to understand that they are in some, always in some kind of firing line. It, it doesn't matter and there's, there's nothing that you can actually do, do about it. The only thing that you can do as a coach is firstly accept that except that it's the way of the world. Um, and the, the second thing is to uh, not be beholden to the, the opinions of others, to understand what it is that, uh, that you are doing, to have a philosophy, to have a vision how you want to play the game, to have a methodology that, that you understand and that you're clear about, uh, and then to re relate, refer your performances to those things and not to the opinions of others. And uh, what you'll often find, of course, is that you didn't reach your own standards because if you uh, if you have all of those things, if you have a, a vision, a methodology, uh, a goal, um, how you want to play, then most often you won't reach those standards because you've set them in that way. and. At the end of each match, at the end of each period, you have to refer to those things um, and the other things I talked about before, mentors, etc., and find the actual reason. And um, that's the way that you, uh, as an individual, go about your work and uh, and keep on a on a level play on a level uh, mental uh, state. And uh, it's a difficult thing to do. Uh, because you're involved with so many uh, different people and so many different groups, um, but uh, you need to, coaches need to find that strategy for themselves. Right, and and to to kind of tie it in with some of the stuff that we've heard from the the wizards in the interviews, it, it really comes down to being true to yourself, because at the end of the day, you're the one who has to look in the mirror, and if you do a lot of things that aren't true to you. That's going to get. That's going to be a very hard thing to do. Whereas if you do, if you stay true to yourself along the way, then yeah, you may get fired. You may not get a job that you wanted to get. Whatever, but at least you'll you know you'll be able to look back and say you did the things the right way, or at least what you perceive to be the right way. The way I've always talked about, it, I've thought thought about it in my own mind is uh, being able to look at yourself in the mirror and. Um, if I can look at myself in the mirror and know that I did all the things that uh, that I wanted to do, that I was striving for, um, then then I can I can live with that. If I compromise my my beliefs for uh, expediency to make my life a little bit easier, to uh, keep my job, to just um, you know protect myself a little bit. Those are the things that make it difficult for me to, to look in the mirror. And um, in the end, I would rather uh, be able to look at myself in the mirror than um, the alternative. Right. Okay. We'll finish there. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. For show notes and more, visit volleyballcoachingwizards.com backslash podcast. Got an idea for a future episode? or want to ask a question, send an email to podcast at volleyballcoachingwizards.com.